You can beat up on the Orioles as bad as you want in the first two games of a series, but I'll tell you right now, you do not sweep the Baltimore Orioles as Jackson Holiday helps the O's avoid the sweep with a win over the Brewers on Sunday. I'll recap the entire weekend series coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Fans, today is Monday, April 15th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the weekend series in Baltimore between the Brewers and the Orioles, in which Milwaukee did come in and take two out of three from the O's. I'll recap all three games, getting you the five things you need to know from each one and highlight some of the big moments from the weekend, including Corbin Burns against his old team, DL Hall and Joey Ortiz back to Baltimore, Jackson Holiday igniting a rally with his first career hit, and much, much more. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to come home with that big win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. So it's a three-game series loss for the Orioles at home against the Milwaukee Brewers, who honestly, it's only been, you know, two weeks and change. The Brewers look like maybe the best team in baseball so far this season. Now 10-4 and four after getting the series win in Baltimore. Brewers won at 11-1 to one on Friday night, came back and won at 11-5 to five on Saturday, but the Orioles avoided the sweep, winning at 6-4 to four on Sunday, and the O's are now 9-6 and six through 15 games this season as they do lose a home series here for the first time on the year. But let's start with the Orioles one win that came on Sunday. And this is multiple times last year. Cause remember they haven't been swept in a series since Adley Rutschman came up in early 2022. And that continued because despite losing the first two games of this set, the Orioles win it six to four on Sunday to avoid the sweep. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from Sunday's Orioles victory. And the first thing you need to know is Jackson Holiday finally got that first big league hit. He was pressing a little bit. He was struggling a little bit. He was 0 for 13 with nine strikeouts and zero hard hit balls when he stepped to the plate in the bottom of the seventh inning on Sunday. But that all went out the door on Sunday. Once you get that first hit, you know, his whole family, Matt Holiday there in the crowd, Cal Ripken, Cal Ripken Jr., excuse me, sitting right next to them, kind of taking in the moment. That is what you needed. You just need to get that first one. He gets it against Abner Uribe in the seventh, and it came in a key spot in this game. The Orioles were trailing four to three in the bottom of the seventh. Jordan Westberg had a leadoff single, and Holiday came to the plate. And if Jackson Holiday were any lesser prospect, I mean, there's a chance you think about laying down a sack bunt there, but he is Jackson Holiday. And finally, he gets a good pitch to hit 1 0. He rips it through the right side into right field for a base hit. And not only was it his first hit, it was his first major league hard hit ball. Hit this thing 101.4 miles per hour off the bat. Good base running by Westberg. He gets to third on the play with nobody out. And it set up the Orioles' rally. And it was just huge for Jackson, who don't think had been taking terrible at bats, but it's certainly been pressing a bit, had been expanding the zone. He'd been facing mostly, if not all righties, and a lot of them had been throwing just back foot breaking balls, breaking balls that kind of start down and in in the strike zone and break down and in out of the zone towards that back foot. And he just could not lay off those pitches. Sometimes he'd foul them off. Sometimes he'd ground out, but he would swing and miss a lot at those pitches. And that was becoming an issue. He got a fastball up in the zone in a hitter's count and drove it into right field. That's what you're going to see a lot from Jackson Holiday. And just a huge lift off the shoulders. And it was kind of awesome that it came in such a huge spot. You know, I'd rather that than it coming, you know, when the game was completely out of hand on Friday night or something. Like, it was a good crowd. It was a huge moment in the game. Big time hit for Holiday. And the second thing you need to know from the Orioles win on Sunday, it's that hit really was what got that seventh inning rally going. And these comeback Orioles 
do it again to avoid the sweep. Westberg, I mentioned, kind of had a soft single through the left side. Then Holiday rips one into right field for a base hit. And at that point, you're thinking, all right, the Orioles should get the one run to tie the game at four as they entered the bottom of the seventh, trailing four to three. But you're looking at a big inning. You're trying to get multiple runs and take the lead. And the Orioles didn't have the huge inning in the seventh, but they got a big enough inning, which was the two runs to take the lead. Gunnar Henderson then scorches an RBI single into right field to tie the game. Unfortunately, Adley Rutschman next up. He did bring the run in. It was still first and third. Nobody out 4-4 game. Adley grounds to shortstop. The Brewers take the double play and allow the run to score to give the O's a 5-4 lead. Now, in hindsight, that was the wrong move by Milwaukee. That was a hard enough hit ball to shortstop that Adamas could have come home and tried to get the out and keep the game tied. But with the way the Brewers were swinging the bat this weekend, I understand saying, hey, we have six more outs to work with. Let's kind of clear this inning, get the double play, and try to get one run. That's what he did. Unfortunately for the Brewers, it didn't work out, and they did not score again. But you want that big inning. You want to take that lead. That is exactly what the O's did. And and credit to Jackson Holiday for kind of keeping that rally going, getting the big single. And again, you just you don't sweep the Baltimore Orioles. It just does not happen. Third thing you need to know from the Orioles' win on Sunday is that offensively it was pretty much a solo home run party besides that big seventh inning for the O's. Now, they did get a run in the first off a Ryan O'Hearn RBI single against Brewer starter Colin Ray. But other than that, it was the long ball. The Orioles on the board started Cedric Mullins, had a solo shot into the flag court in right field in the second that put the Orioles up 2-1, to hit it 101 off the bat, 396 feet. Mullins, after kind of a slow start for the first week and a half or so this season, he has really gotten hot the last few games. Cedric Mullins, after that home run, now has a six-game hit streak for the Orioles, he's been swinging the bat, I mean, really, really well these past few games. Better quality of contact, just looks more comfortable at the plate. He had a two for four with the home run and the double in the game on Sunday. And in this six-game hitting streak, Mullins is now eight for 16. And the cool part was, coming into Sunday, all six of the hits in his five-game hitting streak had all been singles. But then he adds the double and the homer in the game Sunday and continues to swing the bat well. And then... Ryan O'Hearn, who had already had an RBI single, got in on the home run action in the third inning, blasting a ball to right center field for a solo shot that put the Orioles up 3-2, to 107 off the bat, 408 feet. Now, O'Hearn hasn't been hitting the ball as hard so far this year as he did consistently in 2023, but he's still been very productive at the plate and has still been a huge part of this Orioles order when they have faced right-handed pitching. But the cool part for O'Hearn, something he's actually already improved on this year from last year, is his chase rate. His chase rate is only 15%. What that means is he is only swinging at 15% of the pitches that he sees that are outside of the strike zone. That's pretty elite. That is in the 97th percentile so far this year in Major League Baseball. He didn't really walk a lot at all last year. He's already doing it more this season. O'Hearn just knowing that, you know, Heston Kerstad right there on his tails for playing time, and he just keeps stepping up his game. It's fun to see how this guy has transformed himself in an Orioles uniform. And then that final home run came from Colton Kowser. It was a huge, huge piece of insurance in the bottom of the eighth inning. Kowser with a solo shot to put the Orioles up six to four. It was his fourth homer of the season. Kowser stays red hot, now has a hit in every single game he started for the Orioles. This season is like qualified wise, one of the best, if not the best hitter in Major League Baseball so far this year. I mean, Kowser's just been ridiculous. He is now hitting 441 with a 1445 OPS. The dude's unreal. But was what was even better about this home run is that it came off a lefty and a tough lefty at that. Now it's not like Hobie Milner is like the end all be all of like the most dominant lefties in big league bullpens. He honestly is not. But what Hobie Milner can do is keep the ball on the ground. He's got a funky kind of submarine lefty delivery. He does a good job of avoiding home runs. Well, apparently Colton Kowser didn't get that memo because he hit a ball 103.4 off the bat, 422 feet to right field to extend the Oriole lead. Milner is so tough on lefties. Kowser didn't care. It's incredibly fun to watch Colton Kowser swing the bat right now. Fourth thing you need to know from that Sunday win is that Corbin Burns was, I'll say, okay in his first start against his old team. Of course, being traded from the Brewers to the Orioles this offseason and gets to face Milwaukee for the first time in another uniform. And he was he was okay. He pitched five innings for the Orioles in this game. He kept them in it. He certainly didn't have his best stuff. He allowed three runs, two of them earned on six hits. 
with five strikeouts, two walks, and a home run allowed. Once again, he gave up a solo homer in the first inning. It was a leadoff homer hit by William Contreras. Took him 98 pitches to get through five innings. He was laboring along. Now, only six hard hit balls. It's not like the Brewers were crushing it against him. He himself made a throwing error that allowed the third run to score for Milwaukee in the fourth inning to tie the game at three. But that's where he came in and did a great job. It was then second and third with nobody out in a 3-3 game. And he gets pop-up, strikeout, strikeout to get out of the inning and keep it tied. He was in a tough spot in the fifth got out of a jam to keep it tied. Like even when Burns doesn't have his best stuff, he still gets big outs. He still has a 2.28 ERA through four starts with the Orioles. And oh yeah, the O's have won all four games. Corbin Burns has started so far. He is still making a huge difference in this Orioles rotation. Now again, the stuff wasn't crazy dominant. It was not close to the best that we've seen from Corbin Burns this year. Only had seven swings and misses on 37 Brewer swings. The cutter was solid, but other than that, I mean, he was trying to mix his stuff. It was mostly cutter curveball. He threw a lot of sinkers. That was the most sinkers he's thrown, trying to mix things up against a, an offense that knows him well. Like all those hitters know what to expect from Corbin Burns, and that could have been some of it, but still impressive what he was able to fight through and kind of claw his way to those five innings of work. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 6-4 to four win on Sunday over the Brewers is that Craig Kimbrell got into really his first jam of the season, but got out of it, and otherwise the bullpen did just enough to win this ballgame. Now, Jacob Webb did a nice job of getting out of a jam in the sixth inning to keep the game tied at three. Adley Rutschman helped him out with a huge caught stealing of our old friend Joey Ortiz. Then in the seventh, Yenier Cano came in, unfortunately gave up a leadoff home run to put the Brewers up four to three, and it was a homer where he threw a slider to lefties, and Cano does not do that much at all. That slider is by far his third most used pitch. He's mostly sink or change up. Those are because those are his best two pitches. The slider, sometimes he just tosses in there against righties. Rarely does he throw it against a lefty, and you saw why in the seventh with Blake Perkins hitting the solo home run to lead off the inning on a slider to a lefty. Don't think we'll see many more of those from Cano this season. But Cano battled back, got the next three outs. Got the first out of the eighth inning. Orioles went to Danny Coulomb in the eighth. He got a line out and a huge strikeout on a nasty back foot curveball to Joey Ortiz to keep the Orioles in a 5-4 lead. And then Kimbrell came out there and, and really was in danger for the first time this year. Now, I know Kimbrell did blow his first save opportunity of the year a couple weeks ago against the Royals. But when you look back at that game against Kansas City, it was a leadoff blue pit. They stole a couple bases off Kimbrell, and then a sack fly scored the run, and then he got a strikeout to end the inning. Like, his stuff was really good. I don't consider that being in a big-time jam. This was a bit of a jam for Kimbrell. This was a little bit different. This was what we saw a lot of him in Philadelphia last year. After he struck out Oliver Dunn to begin the ninth, he allowed back-to-back -back singles to Blake Perkins and William Contreras. That's why that run in the eighth from the O's was huge. First and third, one out in a 6-4 game, and he just dials it back in. Gets Reese Hoskins swinging on a high fastball. Gets Sal Freelich looking on a great curveball to end the game from Kimbrell. Just really good stuff from him. He's been almost flawless as the Orioles closer, and he closes out a big O's win to avoid the sweep on Sunday. So good vibes coming out of Sunday. Holiday gets his first hit. The O's rally. They win the game. They avoid the sweep. But when you look back at the other two games of the series on Friday and Saturday, the vibes, not so good. The O's kind of got beat up. By, granted, a good Milwaukee team, but still got beat up in those first two games of the series. So first, we'll start with Saturday. Saturday, much more of a competitive game than Friday was, but we'll talk about what went wrong for the O's in that one coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's the formula for winning championships, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not gas. So with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available 
to U.S. customers. And today's episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. Now, I've been told I'm a competitive person. I, I, I think that's fairly true. And, and yeah, I have a competitive side. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like in classic Monopoly, but I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself, and the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get on the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. So the Orioles did get that big win on Sunday to avoid the sweep, but overall lost the series, dropping two of three to the Milwaukee Brewers at Oriole Park this weekend. We're going to turn our attention to what happened on Saturday. Final score in game two of the set, Brewers 11 and Orioles 5. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from that Orioles loss. And the first thing you need to know is our old friend D.L. Hall, well, he was kind of bullied by his old friend in this game. I was in the ballpark Saturday, my first game of the season. I am now 0-1. Uh, in attendance at the O's games, but Hall got the start, of course, was traded to the Brewers in the Corbin Burns deal earlier this offseason. Hadn't been great in his first two starts as a Brewer, but now getting a chance to face his old team. Didn't go well. Did not go well. Hall lasting only three and a third innings, allowing five runs on eight hits with four strikeouts, a walk, and he allowed three home runs in this game. Jordan Westberg, Ryan Mountcastle, Adley Rutschman all got Hall for long balls. Took him 75 pitches to record just 10 outs. And Hall now has a 7.11 ERA as a starter in the Brewers rotation. The O's were all over him. Like from the jump, Ryan Mountcastle just torched a baseball over the big wall in left field. And you're like, all right, this isn't going good for DL Hall. You had Jordan Westberg just poke one to right center field where a two run shot that Mount Castle bomb in the first inning was 111 off the bat went 413 feet Westberg went 400 feet to right center even when Adley went deep later in the game to at that point put the Orioles back on top it was 105 off the bat to left center field I mean Hall gave up a lot of hard contact and that's kind of what's been happening to DL Hall since the Brewers acquired him and put him into their rotation And I really think what's been concerning about D.L. Hall, and not just in this start Saturday, but what he's done with the Brewers as a starter, is that velocity is way down. He was 91 to 94 on Saturday. His average is 92.6 miles per hour on the fastball. Like When Hall was in the bullpen last year with the O's, he was 96, 97, 98 pretty consistently. And his bullpen velo has always been better than his starter velo. But as a starter, he is still sat 94 plus, and he's like 92 right now with the Brewers. That's a little concerning. He didn't get a lot of swing and miss. He wasn't really trusting his changeup too much, despite the right handed hitters in there. I just, from what I saw, I still love DL Hall. I think he's got to end up in the Brewers bullpen. I think he'll be a lockdown reliever still, but the, the try for him to be a starter so far, not going well, and certainly not a great uh, return to Camden Yards for him. But the second thing you need to know from the Orioles lost Saturday is that Dean Kramer was not any better. And you could argue he was even worse in his start for the Orioles. Dean Kramer on Saturday goes four innings, allowing eight runs, six of them earned on 10 hits, struck out three, walked one and allowed two homers, 85 pitches thrown by Dean Kramer, who allowed 11 hard hit balls and got only five swings and misses from Brewers hitters. There's not a lot to dive into here from Kramer because he's been pretty solid this year until this start. This is the big thing. There was way too much stuff over the middle of the plate. Like it wasn't a walks issue, right? You you walk one batter in four innings. Like that's not bad at all. You'll take that every time. Way too much stuff in the middle of the plate, whether it was the fastball, whether it was the sinker or whether it was Kramer, you know, his curveball was like his only pitch that even looked okay at times. But even when it was the breaking stuff, just in the middle of the plate, And the Brewers were not missing the baseball. Quite frankly, they didn't miss the baseball all weekend, but specifically against Kramer on Saturday. 
they just dumped all over him. And, and, and Dean's pretty lucky. Like he wiggled out of a bases loaded jam in the second inning and kept the Orioles up three to one. If he hadn't done that, like imagine how bad this start could have gotten. Like it could have been way, way worse than it was. Just home runs, balls in the middle of the plate. Wind was also blowing out Saturday. That helped the Orioles homers. That helped the Brewers homers. It was kind of crazy weather, but either way, just not what you want from Dean Kramer. Hopefully he will bounce back in his next start. Third thing you need to know from Saturday is that Anthony Santander continued to struggle at the plate. And that was kind of a weekend long and a, a season long theme so far for Santander in the game on Saturday. He goes 0 for 3. He did draw a walk and was hit by a pitch. So he did reach base a couple of times. But after his 0 for 4 on Sunday in the win, he concluded his weekend 0 for 10 with a walk, a strikeout, and a hit by pitch. Santander hitting just 180 with a 586 OPS so far through the 15 games this season. He's popping a lot of balls up. He's not driving the baseball like we usually see. He still has a couple of long balls and, of course, had the huge home run in the win at Fenway on Thursday. But the one thing that makes me not ready to, you know, worry about Anthony Santander yet is that if you remember last year, Santander did the same thing. He was terrible in the first month of the season in 2023. In March and April last year, Santander hit just 213 with a 642 OPS and had a crazy amount of pop-ups at the plate that month as well. Calendar turned to May. Santander turned it on, got on one of his big-time heaters at the plate, and the rest was history. He had another great season for the O's. So I'm expecting that to happen again, but it is another unfortunate slow start for him right in the middle of the Orioles' order. Fourth thing you need to know from this Orioles loss Saturday is that Johan Ramirez, the 28-year-old right-hander, made his Orioles debut out of the bullpen. Ramirez had been acquired from the Mets in a small trade for cash on Thursday after the Mets had uh, DFA'd him a couple days earlier. And Ramirez arrived in Baltimore on Saturday, and because he is out of options, did have to be activated to the roster. And the O's needed him to eat some innings, and he did a little bit of that. On Saturday, Ramirez going an inning and two thirds, allowing two runs on one hit with two K's and a walk through 35 pitches and only one hard hit ball against him in this game. And I got to say, I know he got charged with the two runs, but I was fairly impressed by what I saw from Ramirez in his first outing with the O's. He actually already made a change. Now, Ramirez generally has been a sinker heavy pitcher. He does have a four seamer that he throws, but it's really like a 94 mile per hour sinker that has a lot of movement that he throws a lot. He kind of changed up what kind of fastballs he throws in already his first outing with the Orioles. Ramirez went out there and threw mostly four seamers. It was 15 of his 35 pitches were four seamers compared to only three sinkers. That is not what you usually see from Ramirez. Now he threw a lot of sweepers, which is good. That's his best pitch. But he also threw eight curveballs, which is a pitch that he's been working on. He's introduced this year. And I thought that breaking stuff looked really, really good. For Johan Ramirez, the velocity was good. He was 94 to 96 with the fastball and with the sinker. That is nice to see. And honestly, he was rolling along. He retired the first five of, of six batters he faced. Then, you know, things got away from him a little bit with one out. He hit a batter. He walked a batter. He came out of the game. And unfortunately for him, those runs scored to be added to his line. But I kind of like what I saw from him. The unfortunate part is, and the fifth thing you need to know from Saturday's loss is that Mike Bauman was the one who came in and allowed those runs to score. I mean, second pitch he threw out of the bullpen, allowed an RBI double, then a really hard hit single. Bauman, he was coming off back-to-back -back scoreless outings. I was starting to think, okay, maybe he's turning it back around, but it just wasn't the case. It's been a bad, bad season so far for Mike Bauman. I mean, that just continued in his outing on Saturday. Bauman... I mean, it's pretty safe to say, even though Johan Ramirez has only made one outing for the O's, he's the worst reliever in the Orioles' bullpen right now. I mean, four hard-hit balls against him in an inning and two-thirds. Like, his ERA is only 4-0-5, but that's because some guys have helped him out a bit. I just, I'm not trusting Bauman a lot right now. And here's where we're at with this roster. Like, Mike Elias said over the weekend, John Means, who has now made three rehab starts, you know, may not even take him until the scheduled May 1st to come back. It could be even earlier in April that he returns to the Orioles rotation. When he comes back, the O's are going to need to make a move. And I honestly feel like right now it's going to be down to either Johan Ramirez or Mike Bauman, who are both out of options. They're going to be fighting it out for the next week and a half or two weeks to see who can hold on to that final bullpen spot and who's going to get DF8. And Mike Bauman obviously has a big lead in this category because he's been with the O's organization, you know, for seven plus years. And he's pitched well in the O's for the O's with the, in the minors and in the majors. And the Orioles know him much better. On the flip side, Johan Ramirez right now 
looks better. And so it could be tough for Bauman. We'll see. This John Means returning in a, in a week or two could really put pressure on Bauman to try and keep this role. He just he has not looked good so far this season. But speaking of not looking good, that was uh, the Orioles on Saturday in the 11-5 to loss. That was also the Orioles on Friday. Because in the first game of the series, it was much worse than even that second game was. And we'll quickly go over what happened Friday night to finish off the pod coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Yahoo Finance. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts in one place? Well, with Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. Yahoo Finance, you can use them to consolidate everything in one place. It makes it incredibly easy to manage all of your accounts. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. So whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, charts, and so much more. So for comprehensive financial news and analysis, Visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination. That's yahoofinance.com. One more time, it's yahoofinance.com. So to finish things off on today's episode, we're recapping the Orioles' weekend series lost to the Brewers. Of course, they won 6-4 to on Sunday to avoid the sweep, lost 11-5 to Saturday, and we quickly want to talk about the uh, pretty horrific 11-1 to loss that kicked off this series on Friday night. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from that one. And the first thing you need to know is Tyler Wells was even worse this time for the Orioles. Making his third start of the season, he allowed four runs on six hits over just four innings, struck out three, walked one, allowed a homer, threw 90 pitches in four innings. That's why he came out of there after four innings. And this was a little bit of different Tyler Wells because I've been getting on Wells a bit in his first two starts and talking about how, listen, like he had had some bad, you know, first or second or third innings, had given up some runs, but then he would settle in and he was able to get through six innings and kind of put up some zeros and keep the Orioles in the game. This was not that. He gave up the early runs in this game. He got hit around. He gave up three in the second. He gave up one in the third but he did not settle down. He was able to kind of claw his way through a scoreless fourth, but even with doing that, he had thrown 90 pitches and the day was basically over for Tyler Wells at that point. Like he just couldn't send him back out there. I mean, the slider and the curveball looked good, but other than that, it just, it it wasn't working once again. He gave up a monster shot to Gary Sanchez in the second inning. I just, I don't know. Wells was the Orioles' best starter in the first half last year, then fell apart. I still don't see him as a starter long term. I know he can be a good reliever. If it fails as a starter, he's going to be a good bullpen piece for the Orioles. I just think right now, this is kind of my Tyler Wells hot take. When John Means does come back in a couple of weeks, as I talked about, you know, they'll, they'll have to pick between Ramirez or Bauman to get DFA. That's because Means will push someone to the bullpen. I think most people think, oh, yeah, Cole Irvin, he's been struggling a bit. He'll probably go to the bullpen. I honestly think Irvin will keep the spot, and I think Tyler Wells could go to the bullpen and Means would replace him. Means is is better than both those guys, and Wells has just shown to be much, a much better reliever. That I think he just helps the team more there. As long as you have five other capable starters, I honestly think it might be Wells instead of Irvin that would go to the pen when Means does return. Second thing you need to know from Friday is that uh, Jonathan Heasley, definitely a, a tough outing for him. Six runs in two innings for Jonathan Heasley out of the bullpen. It was kind of a perfect scenario. Like the O's were down four to one. Wells came out after four and you kind of needed somebody to eat some innings. And Heasley, it was perfect. He had barely pitched in a while. He had looked good in his first two outs. You're like, all right, he's a long man. If you can give us two or three innings, even if you lose the game, this could really help. Well, he gave the O's two innings, but it was six runs on seven hits, two Ks, a walk and two homers allowed seven hard hit balls. The Brewers just annihilated Heasley. His breaking balls were not working like they did his first two appearances. And to no surprise, now he was going to get optioned either way after this game to make room for Johan Ramirez, but Heasley was optioned to AAA. I think the Orioles still see something there with Jonathan Heasley. Just uh, didn't work out this time. It might be a, a little bit before we see Heasley back in the big leagues. 
Third thing you need to know from Friday is that Dylan Tate did return to the mound for the Orioles and had a, a really good outing. Two scoreless, hitless innings with a strikeout and a walk. Took him just 29 pitches to get through there. And I was a little worried about Tate. We know he missed the entirety of last season with the forearm and the elbow issues. And coming into Friday's game, Tate had only pitched once in the previous nine days. And I was like, is he hurt again? He's going on the IL. Apparently, Brandon Hyde just said, you know, we don't have the spots to, to, to put him in right now at times. And I really do like that the Orioles are, are still easing Tate back in. Like he hasn't moved to one of their high leverage guys. They're not going to put him in these huge, huge spots. They're trying to still ease him in and they just never found a place for him. Well, they did on Friday and he threw two scoreless. Nice to know that he is still fully healthy and still a part of this Oriole bullpen. And the fourth thing you need to know from Friday is that I mentioned the Orioles only scored one run in this game, and uh, the offense didn't do much. Freddie Peralta, six innings, one run, 11 strikeouts, and no walks for the Brewers ace against the O's offense. But that one run I did mention, the O's did have six hits, but the biggest one was Colton Kowser, who hit himself a solo home run in the fourth inning, just kept his bat rolling, 105 off the bat, 415 feet to right center field for a solo homer, got the O's on the board, made it a 4-1 to game. He's just been unreal. He had a double in the first inning of that game as well for a two-hit day. I talked about him a little bit already, but I mean, all the hype Friday was for Jackson Holiday's home debut, and he had an offer, didn't get that hit. The ballpark was pretty much filled, but it was Colton Cowser, the only guy offensively that really stole the show in that one and just shout out to him for continuing to hit. And then the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 11-1 to loss on Friday is that Joey Ortiz, unlike D.L. Hall, had kind of a tough homecoming. Joey Ortiz had a really nice homecoming to Baltimore on Friday was the other piece along with Hall that went to the Brewers in the Corbin Burns trade and Ortiz got the start in his return to Baltimore hitting ninth and playing third base and man, what a day for him three for five with a triple and two RBIs a couple of hard hit balls I mean shout out to Joey Ortiz man I mean this dude's now hitting 323 with an 836 OPS on the season been a great addition to the Brewers infield with the ability to play third short and second for Milwaukee and, and had to be fun for him. He got interviewed after the win on the Apple TV plus broadcast and you could tell it, it meant a lot to him. He still loves all these guys, but you know, you, you feel a little bit better when you do it against the team that traded you away. And, and I gotta be honest, it was cool to see Joey Ortiz get to do that. And he was really part of just this Brewers offense, which just impressed me so, so much. I mean, there's a reason this team is 10 and four, despite not having an incredible amount of starting pitching and a bullpen that although it was good this weekend has struggled a bit so far this year. And it's this offense. This Brewers offense has been one of the best in baseball. Not their calling card the last couple of years. And they didn't even really have Christian Yelich. He left Friday's game in like the fourth inning with a back injury and did not play the rest of the weekend. He had been one of their best hitters all year. He's their most accomplished hitter career-wise. And they still just didn't miss a beat. 11 runs in back-to-back -back games. They were crushing the ball. They weren't missing any mistakes. They were hitting the ball out of the ballpark. It was hard-hit balls left and right. I was extremely impressed by this young Brewers lineup this weekend. And this team, which after trading Burns and losing Devin Williams, like had a lot of questions going into this season. I don't know if they can sustain this all year, but the NL Central is wide open. I would not be surprised if the Brewers, despite roster wise, it seemed like took a step back, still win that division again because this offense looks better. Freddie Peralta is great and they, they can put together a pitching staff. They do well in that department, but really happy for Joey Ortiz. And, and that offense was just, I mean, the things that William Contreras and Sal Freelick and Willie Adamas did in this series, Reese Hoskins. You got a good group over there in Milwaukee, and maybe the O's would see this team in the Fall Classic. That certainly would be a fun series to watch. But that'll do it for today's episode. O's, of course, only get one of three, but hey, if you're going to lose a series, you're going to lose two or three, it's always nice to win the Sunday game. Then you leave the series on a high note. And next up for the Orioles, well, they stay right here at home. The Minnesota Twins are coming to Baltimore starting tonight. For a three-game series, the Twins on the season six and eight just lost two of three over the weekend to the Tigers, and uh, that series will begin to Nicole Irvin is on the mound for the Orioles, looking to bounce back from a little bit of a shaky start. He has uh, an eight ERA in his first two starts of the year, but we'll see if he can figure things out against Minnesota. And he will face off against the 26-year-old right-hander Louis Varland for Minnesota, who has had just as bad a start. He's got a nine ERA in his first two starts for the Twins. Last time out there, allowed three runs in four innings against that same Milwaukee offense. Varland, a, a guy with some good breaking balls, kind of a breakout candidate uh, for the Twins this year. So should see that really good lefty heavy lineup with Jackson Holiday in there on Monday night. Then I'll be back with you on Tuesday, recapping everything we see from game one between the O's and the Twins on Monday night and any other Orioles news and notes that you may need. But until then, 
I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.